study. When I was in the seventh grade, it was finally time for me to be, become a cheerleader. I had been practicing jumps and cartwheels and splits for years. And I was so excited about doing the group stunts and the cheerleading um, that I saw when my parents took us to the high school basketball games and I'd see all the um, high schoolers doing these uh, wonderful stunts. So I uh, became obsessed about it. And so now it was finally time for the cheerleading tryout meeting. And all my closest friends and some other friends all attended and we learned what it was going to be like to uh, join the uh, cheerleading um, squad and what requirements we had to do in order to make the team. And then we'd have a couple practices and we'd be learning out about um, how to do the school fight song and we would have to do a couple fight cheers and um, a few other things. So we had the practices and I was just having fun and I loved every moment of it. And then it came time for the tryouts. And then after the tryouts, it was time to find out who earned the coveted spots on that cheerleading team. And I checked the list twice and my name was not on the list. I was crushed. Um, I did notice all my closest friends' names were on the list. <laughs> Surely there must have been a mistake, right? Surely. But no, no mistake. My name wasn't there. And then I found myself at the uh, seventh grade basketball game, sitting up in the stands, which it felt like I was all alone, because I was watching all my closest friends partaking in my dream. This was my dream. And then something triggered in my head that um, this was not going to happen next year. Next year, I was going to be on the floor doing those stunts and being a uh, a cheerleader. So I went uh, and I um, realized um, I needed to go home and make a plan. So first uh, step of the plan was figure out why didn't I make that team. Well, one, um, I know when I got out on that big gym floor all alone to do my solo uh, cheer, I was uh, fairly timid. I wasn't as enthusiastic as we needed to be, and that was one of the big requirements. And I realized, too, that um, we did a school fight song. I don't have any rhythm in my body, and I knew we were all going to be doing it together as a team, so I just figured I can kind of follow along and watch the other cheerleaders. And um, I'm sure the judges figured out I didn't know what I was doing, and I was struggling to keep up and on beat. And when I thought about it more, too, I realized I didn't practice or prepare for, uh, to be on that team, because I just assumed I was going to be on that team. Wow. So. I, I had a lot of work to do. So step two was I needed to practice, practice, practice. And um, I immediately started the next day, and I realized I needed to practice in all the areas. I had just practiced in the areas that I was good at and the parts I was excited about for being on the cheerleading uh, team. And so I decided I'm going to learn a couple new skills those other girls don't have. So I, I uh, taught myself the Chinese Splits and the flips. So every morning I'd get up and I'd start stretching in the hallway, um, trying to get my flexibility out to learn how to do those uh, splits. And I'd go outside and I'd lay cushions down and I taught myself how to do the flips. And I convinced my one friend to come and teach me that school fight song. Um, she taught it good enough to me so that I can learn to um, practice it on my own. And I practiced that thing relentlessly because um, this was the area that I knew I wasn't good at. And even though I didn't enjoy that part, I needed to become good at that. But my vision was bigger than my fear. So I went into that meeting as an eighth grader could and held up my head high. And I took notes at the trial meetings, everything we needed to do. And I, uh, when I went to those practices this time, I was serious. And I really practiced and you know, asked the questions that I needed to ask. And then it was the day of the tryouts. And y'all, I left everything on that gym floor. I probably cheered more excitedly than they'd ever heard before. And I was able to keep up with that school fight sign. I could actually do it with my eyes closed. And I showcased my new skills. And this time when I checked the list, my name was on the list. Oh, whoo! That was the most exciting moment of my life. Um, and I loved every moment of being that cheerleader that year. And I continued to practice. Uh, during cheerleading season and for the next nine months until it was time for high school tryouts and uh, JV tryouts. And again, I went to the JV tryouts, or the, well, it was actually high school tryouts, and I left everything out on the 
Jim Floor and I had also taught myself a new skill, a back walkover uh, skill that no one else knew how to do, so I had that. And this time again, when I checked the list, twice my name was not on the list. And as I'm standing there um, taking this in, my girlfriend comes running over, did you see our name on the list? I'm like, no, my name was not on the list. She's like, you checked the wrong list. Our name was on the varsity list. Oh my, I was like beyond excited and hadn't even considered that as a possibility because that really hadn't happened before. And so it was thrilling. I loved, I loved my whole high school year, uh, years of being a cheerleader, but I never stopped practicing. I practiced every single day around uh, each calendar year and, um, and I, I did enjoy all my years as being a cheerleader. So early in my, oops, I'm a little slow on this clicker thing. This is my first time doing using a clicker. Um, so uh, still fairly early in my career as a developer, I came across this book called See You at the Top by Zig Ziglar. It was amazing. It changed my mindset. And then I saw Zig and, uh, say concert. I felt like a concert. Um, he was so amazing. And I was just uh, really excited about this new way of thinking. And, I uh, then expanded on to a couple other personal de uh, development leaders, Brian Tracy, uh, Jim Rohn, to name a few, and uh, you know, just learned a lot uh, and was just fully immersing myself into this. And at the same time in my career, my supervisor came to me and, or to all, there were six of us developers at the time. And he says, you know, we're going in a meeting room and we're going to come out of this meeting room one of you is going to be an automated tester. Okay. <laughs> because we had this expensive piece of rational uh, robot sitting on the shelf, and we're going to be start using it. So he went around the room. Developer one said no. Developer two said no. Three said no. Four said no. Developer five said no. And then I was the last developer. All eyes were on me. And even though I love developing, um, because I had been immersed into this personal development and looking at things as an opportunity, I decided to say yes. And that changed my life. Um, and so I immediately had to find a professional testing group in the area, and I did. And the very first event was they had a two-day seminar with James Bach. And so one of the things I took away from that seminar um, was James was a, James used to be a developer too. And he was talking about how he had become a tester and how much more intellectually challenging being a tester was. And there was just so much more opportunity. So I'm like, okay, well, that sounds good. And then he also talked about he'd be uh, talking at a STAR conference, a testing conference. I'm like, ooh, okay. So I went and asked my boss if I could go to that. And um, he said yes. And so after I went to that conference, I was this was going to be my career. I was so excited. And I have loved every moment of being a tester through the years. And that's uh, led me into my current role in leadership. And now I have this awesome group of testers, awesome managers, and I want to be able to keep them. And so I need to figure out how I can be a best, the best leader I can be so that they want to stay in my staff. So... Uh, I started studying leadership, and these are the three uh, things that I'm going to talk to you about today. I want you to imagine yourself doing them if you aren't already doing them, and uh, we'll go through them in more detail. So winning the morning, winning the day. Um, it's so important to get up early and have your own planned uh, morning routines. Then honor, embrace, and face your fears. Love this quote. Everything you ever wanted is on the other side of fear. So we're going to talk about getting on the other side of fear. And then the continuous learning and growing we all should do. I would imagine most of us in this room love to grow um, and learn because we're all here. And then uh, a final section on being the best and some additional ideas on how to help us incorporate these three items into our daily practice. So I am curious how many of you have heard of any of these people, Brenda Bouchard. Uh, Michael Hyatt, Rachel Hollis, John Maxwell, uh, Mel Robbins, 
and Bo Eason. You might have heard of Bo Eason because he's a football player. But, um, and then in the previous years, these are some of, of the other leaders that I've um, studied. And I've just learned about these three in the last three years, one to three years. So. so I have a different question for you. How many of you, when you wake up in the morning, take your phone and you begin scrolling through it, and you're looking at your <laughs> social e you know, your social accounts, your email, work or personal, or you're looking at the news. Um, and now think about how many minutes you spend doing that. So <laughs> there are cer certain things that uh, the leaders that I follow do do in the morning in that first critical hour and certain things that they don't do. Well, we can guess. They don't do that phone scrolling. They avoid the phone um, for the first hour like the plague. So, let's see. so I've been reading about these uh, reasons why we need to get up and uh, start your day early <laughs> and um, be, you know, do some fruitful things for yourself. Well, until possibly two years ago, I was this person. I uh, would be excited every night. I'm going to get up early. Tomorrow's going to be the day. Tomorrow's going to be the day I'm going to start. And then the morning would come, and I'd hit that snooze alarm, and I'd hit the snooze alarm again, and I'd hit that snooze alarm every nine minutes for about an hour and a half until I finally bolted out of bed and <laughs> time to get my workout in and get to work. And then uh, I came across Mel Robbins' five-second rule. And that's what uh, changed for me. So her rule is, and she used it to get herself out of bed, and she's expanded it now. But um, what you do is uh, you count. As soon as your snooze alarm goes off, you immediately, immediately being, begin counting. Five, four, three, two, one. And then you're supposed to bolt out of bed um, like a rocket ship. By the time you hit one or before, the, before you hit run, one. And, and that's because your brain doesn't have time to convince you to hit that snooze, <laughs> snooze alarm. And so this is what actually has worked for me. And um, let's see what was this. Oh, okay. Yes, we have a problem here. We'll, we'll go on. Okay. So listed here are some of those key ideas uh, of morning routine recommendations that a lot of these leaders have talked about. And um, I was going to cover a couple of them. Drinking water first thing in the morning, the first 10 minutes, um, it helps with what's called dehydration fatigue. And that will also help regulate you to uh, wake you up faster. So that's an easy thing to do in um, the first 15 minutes of your life or morning. And then a gratitude. You've probably all read the studies or heard how important it is to you know think of grateful things and be, just be grateful. And, you can do that. Just think of um, some grateful things you're, things you're grateful for in the morning. Um, or you can journal it out. Or you can go on. Um, John Gordon is another person I follow. And he talks about he does a grateful walk first thing in the morning. But doing some of these things, you could take time to read, study, and learn in some area you want to grow in, such as becoming a leader. And the moving yoga and workout, that's my favorite. That's my number one um, recommendation. And we'll go into that a little bit further. So the big thing that I want to stress is let's just start. You just need to start with 15 minutes. Do a micro start because, um, and just picking one or two of the items instead of trying to do them all because chances are you won't do them all. You can then add to it, and this comes from personal experience. And I just picked what I thought were maybe a couple of the easiest ones to do, and you can start, start with uh, small amounts of time, and again, you can expand on it. So here are some suggestions for finding that 15 minutes. Uh, if you happen to scroll on your uh, phone 15 minutes in the evening, looking at social media apps and getting stuck into like the cutest cat picture or something, you know, maybe you can stop that. Or if you watch TV, just record that show so you can get to bed 15 minutes earlier if you don't have 15 minutes to give. Or if you're one of those people that actually do scroll, first thing in the morning and you thought, oh, I school for at least 15 minutes. Well, there you have your 15 minutes. You don't even have to change anything as far as giving up time. So
So a healthy person has a thousand wishes and a sick person has one. So 23 years ago, I made a decision and became a zealot for working out after attending a Tony Robbins um, conference. And it was a 10-day conference. And he talked about one of the days was on health. And basically, uh, the gist of it is if you don't have your health, you don't have much, much else. Because if you're unhealthy or you're not feeling well, you're not much help to others that you might, you know, you could be, or you're not help, much help to yourself. And when you're sick, what's the one thing you think about? You only think about getting well, right? So that's when I, um, at that seminar, I developed my morning must. And my morning must was to do the, the workout. And um, so even when I was a professional snoozer, I did this morning must. I just want to end with, it, it can be hard and it will be hard. Um, just like exercising in the beginning for me was hard, and getting up was hard. But I just, um, after completing these items, it felt so much better than hitting the snooze button. It's just hard. So you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it too. And just uh, a couple more notes on this. Um, for the exercising, which is the big one that I you know, really think is important to do, um, if you just start exercising for five minutes, it's Five minutes, once you get into those five minutes, exercise usually becomes easier and easier. So just tell yourself you're going to do five minutes or six minutes, and you should be good there. And that's the same thing with even getting up. You know, I would bolt out of bed, do my rocket ship thing, but it still was hard. But, you know, you get through those first five minutes. You drink your water. You maybe just do a little walk, brush your teeth, and um, then you're up. Whoops, did I go backwards? this thing upside down. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about facing your fears. Uh, embracing the suck, as I call it. Uh, you are going to do what? Are you crazy? My <laughs> husband said to me, as I had just told him as I'm walking out the door and I'm going to a weekend seminar, that I might be walking across 15 feet of hot coals. As I was shutting the door, he's like shouting, remember, you have a six-year-old daughter at home. <laughs> okay. And then there I was, standing in front of that 15 feet of hot coals with no more time to think. I could only, uh, I had to take action. So I walked across those hot coals as I had been taught, deliberately saying, cool moss, cool moss, cool moss, until I did successfully make it off of those uh, 15 feet of hot coals. And I actually went on and did it two more times. I went to another weekend seminar where we walked across it. And then that 10-day seminar I went, uh, we had to walk across 40 feet of hot coals. And so um, the point of doing that is to teach us that if we can walk across hot coals and I'm facing another kind of fear, I should just bring that to my mind. If I can walk across hot coals, I certainly can do this other thing that I uh, really fear doing. So. Uh, I ask you to think about maybe a current fear um, that you've conquered and faced. Uh, and you can do the same thing. If it's some big fear you faced, you can think about that when you're trying to do some other fear, a current fear that you're trying to face. Uh, it can maybe help you with that. So there's fear of failure, and that's a bigger one, like uh, public speaking. Or there is another thing called fear of discomfort. And that's not as dramatic as fear of failure, but it's a, certainly something that we, most of us, face even on a daily basis or fairly often. So my favorite time, um, vacation, part of vacation time, was always pool time. And it would take me 45 minutes to an hour or longer to get into the pool. I, and I was definitely like, I'm definitely like this girl. I'm an inch by inch by inch girl. It didn't tell, matter how many people, different people, everyone say, just jump in and do it. I couldn't do it. I could not get over that this fear of discomfort of just jumping into the water straight. And then a couple years ago, I was taking an online Mel Robbins course. And she was talking about this fear of discomfort thing and that you need to uh, 
it's important to try to do it before you go to work. Figure out some fear that you have and conquer it before you get to work because then that helps you in your work day. You might have another thing you're going to face and you're like, well, I've already faced this one thing. I certainly can uh, face this uh, discomfort. And she gave us several ideas or said we could come up with one on our own. Well, her, one of her ideas was taking a cold shower. Well, I knew I couldn't take a cold shower, but I assigned myself the task that I could stay in the shower, and we had two months to do this, I could stay in the shower for 60 seconds, the cold shower at the end. So y'all, it took me, I did one second per day until 60 seconds <laughs> came up. That's how I did it. And um, I actually still practice this to this day, and uh, it's still, many times, it's hard to convince your brain to do it, but once you've done that, you're just kind of training your ba brain, hey, I'm in control of this. So the other thing on um, fears, facing your fears, is, um, and especially if you're thinking about failure, you just need to change your mindset on failure and start thinking of any time you fail, it's really, it's a learning opportunity. You've just figured out one way to do it, uh, not to do it, and the next time you might need to do it differently, and you can keep learning that way. And same with um, a fear of discomfort, like at work. So as testers and test leaders, oftentimes we have to present that bad news no one wants to hear. And, you know, it takes practice uh, doing it verbally. Try to do it verbally versus trying to send in an email uh, that, yeah, your, the product isn't of good quality or we're going to be late because we still have to do these kind of tests or here are the rest. So that's one way to practice a fear of discomfort at work. So Lewis Howells from the School of Greatness uh, talks about he's had so many fears and how he finally determined how he was going to get over his fears is he's just going to take a fear at a time and he's going to work on that fear until he gets over that and then he'll take his next uh, fear. And he talked about his fear of talking to girls. And so he uh, decided he would talk to a different girl every single day um, and it didn't matter whether the girl rejected him or not. So, and he said he had plenty of rejections, the girl wouldn't talk to him, but he had a lot of good conversations too. And he did it until he actually just got over, um, and it never bothered me to get nervous whenever he needed to talk to a girl. So that's one way of also uh, facing some kind of fear. So get comfortable with the uncomfortable, as that's where you're gonna go, grow. Do it afraid, that's my mantra. I made this my mantra for 2019, May, some of you may want to join me for the rest of the year. Um, my biggest fear of all time is what I'm doing right now, uh, public speaking. This is only my second time I've ever done a talk, and um, I've listened to leaders over the years and different uh, speakers and these professional uh, development leaders I've listened to. Uh, too, and they all talk about that they've had the fear of stage fright or doing presentations. And sometimes they say it never goes away. But they said, you just need to jump in and take action and just do it and, you know, and then keep repeating and doing it. And so that's, that's what I'm doing here today. So you're, you're all lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being my audience, right? <laughs> but as leaders, I believe we should all have a certain mindset uh, servant mindset, and I think this can help us when we're afraid, because this means when you're thinking more about the other person you're serving than yourself, um, and you're not just sitting in fear of doing it. So that's how I decided to approach um, the audience. Now I'm serving you as my audience, and so I'm trying to help uh, give something to you. And that's the same for us when we're uh, working. Think of your team or your coworkers or your boss. All these people need you to show up and be your best self. And if you do that, then you can be a servant leader to them. And when you're concentrating on them, that really kind of can take away the discomfort or uh, anything you might be feeling because you're, you're more concerned about what's going on with um, whoever you're working with. Okay, so we're going to do another class exercise, and we don't have time to do all of this. I want you to think of one... Um, fear that's holding you back. It can be small or big, um, that from being the best leader you can be, or it, it can be a different kind of fear too. Um, and 
we're going to talk about uh, why, um, just think about why it's important to overcome. And I'm going to share how I did one of these items. Again, you can get these slides later and go through all of it as an exercise for yourself if you'd like. Um, but I'm going to um, share with you what I did for this talk. And um, I wrote down what would happen if my fear comes true and how I would handle it. So I definitely said I may fail, I could fail, but I'm going to look at it as a learning opportunity. I'm hoping I will get um, great feedback. I might get a lot of negative feedback. Hopefully I'll get some positive feedback and some constructive feedback. But it doesn't matter what kind of feedback I get. I would love to get feedback um, so that I can improve for my next talk. Um, and I might be ridiculed. I am the queen of embarrassing myself. I, mean, <laughs> I do it more than probably, way more than the average person. And so I have to date lived through all of it, and uh, hopefully I'll live through today too. So. so writing it down helps it make it like, okay, well, at least you've kind of figured out how you're going to deal with it. So 30 seconds, share your fear with uh, your neighbor. Um, if you don't want to share with a neighbor that you know, share with someone else. But um, this could be discomforting for some of you. I know some people might get trembling of the heart. I don't want to speak, but so we're going to make you do the exercise of doing the fear of discomfort. Um, so just take 30 seconds and share a fear that comes to mind that you want to get over it and why it's important. So this next part is probably going to be the easiest part for all of you to do the continuous learning and growing that we must do. And I love this quote, the moment you start, stop learning, you stop leading. So as testers, uh, we have the advantage of being curious by nature. And this is one of the many things that I think makes us good at our craft. And probably why uh, we are curious is because we, we also like to learn. And there's always something new to learn about the software, or to learn a new skill set as a tester. And because we like all this, this can easily transfer into being leaders uh, and learning about leadership too. And I would venture that, again, most of you, if not all of you in this room want to learn, um, you want to become better leaders, because that's why you chose this conference, a uh, testing leadership conference. So Jerry Weinberg, uh, many of you know Jerry, uh, and I was, we lost him this past October. He's a role model for many of us. Um, he's left a lot of uh, books and articles out there for you to read if you haven't heard of him. I was fortunate enough to be able to attend uh, Jerry's Problem Solving Leadership a few years back with Esther Derby. And um, one of the biggest lessons I took away from that conference is that uh, if he wanted to learn something, he said, he, he decided, I'm going to learn on this topic, and then I'm going to write on it, and then I'm going to verbally share it. And that way it would uh, sink in better. So I want to learn on leadership, and so I figured this is the best way to learn. Um, so I've taken all many of the notes that I've had on leadership from these conferences I've attended, and um, then I had to write about it, to put the speech together, and now I'm verbally sharing it. So hopefully <laughs> um, I'm learning it better. And this is a quick quote that I like, and again, that's why I'm doing it. We teach best what we most need to learn. And this is actually a quote by James Bach, dad, uh, Richard Bach. <laughs> what? Oh, OK. OK. So in Carol S. Dweck's uh, book titled Mindset, the New Psychology of Success book, uh, she discusses the importance of a growth mindset. and. Uh, she also discusses you could have a fixed mindset, and if you do, you can change that into a growth mindset. But it's so important to have a growth mindset. And, uh, John C. Maxwell, who I referred to earlier, he's written over 100 books. 82 of the books have been on leadership. He's uh, been, uh, they, he has been described as the number one leadership expert in the world. Um, and he's written a couple books on growth. Although there is a theme, I haven't read all of his books at, by any means, but it seems to, in most of the books that he writes, uh, he has some portion talking about growth and how important that is. So his most recent uh, book called Leadership, uh, Chapter 3, Goals to Growth, The Personal Development Shift, he covers why it's so much more important to have a growth plan than goals. Because as he said, if you have a growth plan, your goals are going to follow along with you. 
And then the 15 Reputable Laws of Growth. If you don't read that book and become excited about growth, um, <laughs> it might not happen. <laughs> <laughs> so James Bach, uh, as most of you know too, uh, He's definitely focused on growth and learning. And uh, if you don't know James's backstory, he's actually a high school dropout. And he started on his growth journey from day one. He's also one of the most well-known testers and um, self-educated, highly paid testers in our community. And he's written this book up there called The Secrets of a Buccaneer Scholar, How Self-Education and Pursuit of Passion Can Lead to a Lifetime of Success. And uh, the themes of his book really are, it's the focus is on self-education and creating your own learning curriculum. And he also uh, happened to discuss uh, how he overcomes his fear in this book by discovering his passion, his why, which has been bigger than his fear. So I encourage you to uh, look into this book. In chapter 11, he specifically has a chapter uh, uh, called Treasure Map, The Power of a Personal Syllabus. If any of you need ideas on how to come up with your own growth uh, syllabus, and there's a lot of good information in that book. So to wrap up this section, Brenda Bouchard has stated, leaders are always students first, just as experts are students first. We don't stop learning. And again, and it must be part of our growth mindset. And it's exciting uh, to be learning and growing. So just take a couple minutes. No, a couple minutes, a couple seconds, <laughs> since we are short on time. Just think about what might be your first idea you might want to start in um, for your growth plan. It can be just uh, getting James's book and reading through that and learning some ideas on how to test better and things you might want to study for testing and how you might want to grow. So the other thing that I learned at Jerry's course um, the problem solving course was an example he shared that I've never forgotten and it had to do with him writing books. And he talked about what if he had, uh, what if one of the sentences in the book, and he emphasized one sentence was confusing to the reader. And how unfair that would be to the multitude of people who bought his book. They were just confused by the one sentence. And what he stressed was it's so important to keep working that sentence and redoing it until you get it right. And for me, that became a metaphor for life to uh, that we must be willing to redo and redo something until we can actually get it right. So developing a plan and practice and preparation is so important um, for uh, incorporating all of these things we're talking about. And I was at a recent seminar last year and Bo Eason was a speaker there and he, he challenged us to be the best person we can be. And I love facing challenges, as I believe that challenges are what makes us grow. And actually, that was the inspiration for the title of this speech, is Are You the Best Leader You Can Be? So he talked about he had a plan and a vision at age nine to become the best uh, safety in the world uh, as a football player. And he continuously worked that plan day after day from age nine. And he tried to get in colleges. The colleges rejected him. He kind of forced himself into this college. I mean, he kept coming back even though they didn't have anything for him, and eventually they let him play on the, the team. And then he actually was a first-round draft for the Houston Oilers back in um, the 80s. And one of the things that he did was he decided because um, he's small in nature and wasn't really designed to be a football player, he still needed to do the extra practice. And so he would show up for practice two and a half hours early before the actual practice started, and he would stay two and a half hours after practice. And he just did this. This was part of his plan on becoming the best safety in the world. And then he was traded to the 49ers. And on the 49er team was Jerry Rice. And since we have from people from all over, you might not be familiar with football, um, or even here you might not be familiar with football. And um, Jerry Rice is the best NFL receiver of all time. And he, uh, so it was time for the first practice of the 49ers. And so Bo's out and getting out in the field to do his practice. And lo and behold, Jerry Rice is already out in the field practicing. And then he found out that uh, Jerry Rice stays two and a half or three hours after practice. So he was even staying longer um, and coming earlier for practices than Bo had. 
So definitely contributed to why he was one of the best receivers in the world. And uh, then uh, Bo also noticed during the actual practice, um, every time Jerry received a football, he would run it into the end zone, 100 yards there and back. And he continued to do that. And he noticed none of the other receivers were doing that. So he was curious, and he asked Jerry, hey, Jerry, why, are you, why do you always run into the football uh, into the end zone? Because Jerry said when these hands catch a football, this body always ends up in the end zone. I love that. I mean, that's such a cool um, example of being the best. And the message is we just need to be willing to put in the time to be the best. So I wanted to uh, thank, just put up here some of the test leaders that have impacted me over the years. And Anna just left. She's one of them. Um, so I've learned, I learned so many lessons back when I didn't make that seventh grade uh, cheerleading team. And many of these lessons, um, if I would have made it, I wanted to might have learned as early as I did the life skills um, that I needed to uh, become uh, eighth grade cheer or the varsity cheerleader as a freshman. These are the same practices many of these leaders discuss uh, along with what I've shared here today. And, um, but what I found is I haven't consistently followed these practices throughout my career. And that's the area that I now need to work on. Um, and so the final story I want to conclude with um, is something I heard John Maxwell talk about at a conference this past December. And he talked about uh, the importance of consistency. And he called it the rule of five. So he, he the example he gave was, um, cutting down a tree, and he walks us through his rule of five. So you have to have a goal. you got to know that you want to cut down a tree. you got to know what you want to accomplish. And then you have to have the right tools. He talked about if you're using a baseball bat towards that um, tree versus using an ax, um, which is the proper tool. Then he said stay focused on that same tree, because you might have a forest of trees or many trees in your yard or wherever you're cutting that tree down, and then you might want to go out and start chopping at the other trees. But he's like, you got to stay focused on the primary goal. And then you need to be consistent um, in that consistency compounds. He says, you only need to hit that ax at that tree five times a day, and then you're done. Versus what some people do if you set a goal, uh, myself included, you might go and spend eight to 12 hours, hours on that goal, or we're hacking away at that tree for 12 hours, and the next day you get up and you can't like move around. And it's another day, you can't move around. And so you take a few days, and then you're gun ho again, and you go six hours. And then pretty soon you're like, oh, I'm so tired after six hours, and then you just drop it. So just five times uh, a day, swing at that tree. And then he said, don't quit. That tree will eventually fall down, and just be patient. And then he shared, uh, again, again, an example of the rule of five and how he writes books. And as I shared, he's written over 100 books. So he does this in the first hour. This is what he does his first hour of every morning. He reads whatever topic, whatever book he's decided he's going to write about. Um, he reads on that topic. He thinks about it. He files the information. And he asks questions about the topic. And then he writes. And he says, you know, doing these five essential things every day will change our lives. So uh, the best thing on being the best is you only have to be the best you can be. Uh, we're only in competition with ourselves, no one else. We're unique. So I love this quote. Always dream and shoot higher than you know you can do. And don't bother just to be better than your contemporaries or predecessors. Try to be better than yourself, William Faulkner. I think that's such a cool quote. So just imagine yourself doing these uh, things I discussed today, winning the morning, facing your fears, and doing your growth plan. Um, and doing them consistently. And just think uh, how much farther we'll be next year when we come to this leadership uh, conference. Uh, so um, if you're interested, I have my email, or you can leave me a card. I was thinking maybe we can continue to talk about this. If anybody's interested in it like I am, you could um, put Test Leaders Mastermind in the email if you want to continue, can you continue with this. So. I challenge you back today, the day that you draw the line in the sand, that I am going to be the best leader I can be. And really, you can do it. Most of it's simple. It's not easy. 
but we aren't most people. Let's go be the best leaders we can be. And here's just another um, thing on being the best. And I have a couple slides of uh, different references, and I have many, many, many more pages of it. So if you get in contact with me, you get through this, I have more to share. Thank you.